You alone save me Cause brokenness is all I bring You resurrect and you redeem You alone save me Rock of ages, cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure save from wrath and make me We're building a church. And the way you build a church is you step a family into the baptistry. You break bread together. You sing and you hear God's word ministered. That's how you build a church. But it also happens we're putting up an edifice. We're, we're constructing just that way a few hundred yards. And if you haven't been out to see it yet, I hope you will. We're by God's faithfulness and folks' generosity well under the underway in, in having a new building in which to hold our church in which we might worship. If you haven't had a chance to give to that, you can. We hope you will. Um, it will be a place where we can minister to one another and worship the, the Almighty God. Well, we've been singing from time to time over the last few weeks songs that have in their theme something about building and usually something about the foundations, about, about rocks. We know that makes sense because Christ himself in Matthew 7 said, those who hear these words and obey them will be like the one who has built his house upon a rock. I'm told by expert authorities in geology and by Steve Boone that just north of here is a mixture of sandstone and clay, just perfect for building a building. We will have indeed built that church building upon the rock. Paul told us through his letter to the, the church at Corinth, your fathers of old drank from water that came from the rock. And then Paul, never wanting us to miss it, said, that rock was Christ. So our rock too is Christ. There's a picture of a rock. That's not an Oakdale. It's not even close to Oakdale. That's, that's in a place called the Mendip Hills. We've sung this morning, Rock of Ages, a rendition written by our friend Charlie Hall not too long ago. But the original hymn, Rock of Ages, was first published the same year our forebears signed the Declaration of Independence. It was 1776 when it was published, but it was written about 10 years earlier. The Reverend Augustus Tolity. Can you imagine a name like that? Augustus Tolity was walking along the Mendip Hills. He came to a, a little park called the Burlington Comb. It was a, it was a pass in those very rocks and there came upon him a great squall and in the midst of that storm Augustus found refuge in the rock and he conceived of and wrote down the words 
rock of ages, cleft for me. I think I would have liked Augustus. He was, he was doing a little bit of wordplay here. I've sung this song probably like you a thousand times from the pew. And I've always thought rock of ages that is a cleft for me. A cleft is a, a crevice. It's a freighty hole. It's a good spot to hide from a storm. And in one sense, that's the meaning. Rock of Ages, a cleft for me, a place to hide. But if we were living in King George's England, we would have used the word cleft as a past tense verb that said split. And if we think about it that way, Rock of Ages, that was cleft for me. Think about this rock that Paul refers to, the Christ, the Holy One, split for me. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Christ was cleft for us. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Well, we have water. We have blood. We're going to celebrate that today in the Lord's Supper, a remembrance thereof. But look what else Augustus does. One other little double meaning. If we could go to those last words of this next stanza, be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Those Romans 6, 23 tell us all were condemned. We were under God's wrath. And so we desperately needed that. We needed a saving and he provided that. But more, he made us pure. Imagine that. We weren't merely released a prisoner can be released, and they are today. They're no longer guilty. They're no longer under the death penalty. But are they, are they welcome? Surely not. Not without grudging or not without an asterisk by their name. We have no asterisk. We have no grudging welcome. Our welcome that we have been made pure is that of the prodigal son returning to his father. Hear the words from Luke. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, this prodigal. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, he's found. And they began to celebrate. So we sit this morning doubly cured of wrath, and made pure by this holy Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for the words of this song. Thank you for Augustus, for Charlie, and for Jamie who lead us into your presence. But Lord, more thank you for this Christ, this rock, who's cleft for us, Father, that we might have this double cure from wrath and indeed made pure. Amen. Nothing in my hand I bring Simply to the cross I cling Naked come to thee for dress Helpless look to thee for grace Foul I to the fountain fly Wash me, Savior, or I die You resurrect and you redeem. 
save me Let me hear you And brokenness is all I bring You resurrect and you redeem And you alone save me Let's Sing that first verse again Rock of ages, cleft for me Let me hide myself in thee Let the water and the blood From thy wounded side which flowed Be of sin the double cure Save from wrath and make me pure Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you this morning. We thank you for the reminder of what you have done for us. And not just the fact that you provide safety and shelter to us, provision for us, that is incredibly important in our lives. But God, also the reminder that that did not come freely, that it came with a sacrifice made by you, made by your son, and God, we have so much to be thankful for and so much to celebrate today as we prepare to participate in communion. God, we also are reminded of your sacrifice and reminded of just how much you love us. So Father, may in our own hearts, may we just show you how much we love you and how much appreciation we have for what you've done for us. We love you, God. Thank you for this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys be seated. Thank you. Let me invite you to take out your message notes <clears throat> this morning from inside your bulletin and you can kind of use that to follow along with us. Obviously, this morning, as you can see before me, we are about to, to uh, celebrate and participate in the Lord's Supper. And I want to talk just a little bit about the Lord's Supper and talk a little bit about what it means and, and how we should approach it every time that we come to it. On the evening that he was betrayed and arrested, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples, a last meal with them. He did this not only to prepare them for what was about to happen, but also to instruct future Christians in how to remember and celebrate the sacrifice that he was about to make. More than 2,000 years later, we as Christians continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper in three ways. And I'd ask you to write these things down. First, as a reminder of what Jesus did for us in the past. During the Last Supper, Jesus used the bread that they were eating and the wine that they were drinking to, to symbolize his body and his blood, which would be broken and sacrificed for the sins of man. In Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, Jesus said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This sacrifice made it possible for us to be forgiven of our sins. And it made it possible for us to have eternal life in heaven if we choose to place our faith in Jesus as our Savior. So when we come together and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. Secondly, we celebrate the Lord's Supper as a symbol of our present relationship with Him. Once we become a Christian, God begins a process called discipleship where he goes to work in our hearts to make us more and more and more like Christ. Did you know that you were not just put on this earth to sit and soak up blessing? You were actually put here to accomplish something. And part of that mission is for you to become more and more like Christ each and every day that you live. The Lord's Supper plays an important part in that. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, everyone should take a careful look at themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. And so every single time that we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are to examine ourselves, examine our hearts, and when we do that, you know what? We often find sin. This is normal. 
It's not a reason to avoid the Lord's Supper. It is a reminder that only He can take our sins away. And so part of celebrating the Lord's Supper is setting aside some time to get our hearts right with God. And we're going to do that in just a moment. Now, as we think about the Lord's Supper as a symbol of our present relationship with Christ, it makes sense that only those who have accepted Christ should participate. This is not in any way to embarrass anybody, but I think you would agree it makes no sense to try to symbolize a relationship that you don't yet have. And so whether you're a child or an adult, if you've not yet reached the place where you're ready to surrender your heart, your life, and your eternity to God, I want to ask you not to participate in the Lord's Supper today. Simply pass the plate on to the next person when it comes to you. And here's my promise. You will not be the only person who does that. Okay? The Lord's Supper is a reminder of what Jesus did in the past. It's a symbol of our relationship with him right now in the present. And number three, it is a promise of what he will do in the future. Jesus promised that he would one day return to usher in the eternal kingdom of God and that on that day we would share with him in a great wedding banquet of celebration. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so when we come together today and we eat the bread and we drink from the cup, think about it, it's like a rehearsal dinner of what will be the greatest victory celebration in all of history. Don't you feel privileged to be a part of that today? I do. Do you see that the Lord's Supper is a reminder of what Jesus did for us in the past? It's a symbol of our relationship with him in the present, and it's a promise of his return to us in the future. Now, as we prepare now to share in the Lord's Supper, let's take a few moments to seek God's grace, to seek God's forgiveness, and to get our hearts right with him. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, we focus our hearts on our Heavenly Father. Our desire is to recognize our sin, admit it, turn from it, and be forgiven of it. So right now, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 51. And as I read these words written thousands of years ago by King David, I want to challenge you to actually make them your prayer this morning, okay? With heads bowed, eyes closed, focus on God's word, Make this your prayer. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Because I recognize my rebellion and because of your great compassion, would you blot out the stain of my sin? Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. I know that you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. I know that you will not reject a broken and repentant heart. So will you create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. I give thanks that you don't banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. In response to your grace, I will teach your ways to the rebellious and they will return to you. So God, unseal my lips that my mouth may praise you and I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Restore me, God, to the joy of my salvation. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Take some time right now to reflect on the condition of your heart. Begin by asking God to show you the sin that he would have you deal with right now. Just ask him.
as he shows you the sin that he would have you deal with, confess that to him. Acknowledge it. Yes, God, I see it. I recognize it. I confirm it. And then, take that sin and repent of it. To repent is more than just to ask forgiveness. To repent is to turn completely in the opposite direction. To replace that sin with something that is pleasing to God in your life. Ask for His help to repent. And as you repent, then you ask forgiveness. God, forgive me for this sin. Take it as far as the east is from the west. Take it to the bottom of the ocean. Forgive me, Father. (coughs) And then finally, give thanks. Thank you, God that you love me so much you're willing to forgive me even when I mess up over and over and over again. God, I may have prayed about this same sin many, many times and yet, though my grace is big, my sin, it rather is big. God, your grace is so much bigger. Thank you for that. I celebrate the kind of God you are who will love me and give me exactly what I do not deserve. Thank you, Heavenly Father.
to come forward. Corinthians 11 24 says on the same night in which he was betrayed Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me Over and over I'll sing 
John 6, 58 says, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. For he that eats this bread shall live forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the body of Christ broken in our place. God, may our lives and our relationships with one another as the body of Christ, the church, reflect the same kind of sacrificial love displayed on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. also took the cup and when he had drank saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you show the lord's death until he comes again
His wounds have paid my ransom. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. First John 1 John 1.7 says that according to the law, all things are cleansed with blood. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Father, we thank you this morning for the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, spilled as a sacrifice for our sins. God, may we live our lives and, and may our lives reflect the grace that you have shown by giving us exactly what we did not deserve. And we love you, Heavenly Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is our tradition here at Oakdale that each time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we also take an offering which is used to help meet the needs of hurting people in our church and in our community. We will do that by having the deacons uh, receive that offering at the exits to the auditorium this morning. And I want you to know that you don't need to feel any pressure at all to give, but if you would like to participate in that, you are welcome to do so. We're going to finish with an attitude of celebration as Jamie closes out the service. Thank you for being a part this morning. Let's stand together. You alone save me. Thank you.